Hi, and welcome back to the committee program. I am your host, Arun Chaudhary. And now we have deep cuts. We're going to take a deep dive on the conception and misconceptions around modern slavery uh, in a segment set up by the show's own Julia Doubleday. Julia, what is in store? Uh, thanks, Arun. Yeah, so today we have joining us Emily Kenway. She's a writer, activist, and former policy advisor. She's also the author of the book, The Truth About Modern Slavery. She's joining us today to help us take a critical eye to the entire concept of modern slavery as a framing with the potential to obscure the reality that worker exploitation and abuse is a feature, not a bug, of our modern economy. Drawing on her extensive work in the field, Emily makes the case that while UK conservatives vocally condemn modern slavery and politicians across the spectrum refer to it as an apolitical issue, they continue to advocate policies that lead to harm, vulnerability, and exploitation among workers generally, and in particular, migrants, sex workers, and workers in corporate supply chains. So thank you so much for your book and for being here today, Emily. Thank you very much for having me. So why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about your background and your work in this field? Yeah, so I've spent many years working on social justice campaigns in a variety of capacities. And um, I was doing a lot of work on workers' rights issues back around the time that the UK got the idea for a law on modern slavery, which partly came from California, where there's um, an act that requires large companies to make an, an uh, to make a disclosure about their supply chains and exploitation in their supply chains. And at that time, um, I didn't really put two and two together about how this modern slavery phrase that was coming to us from kind of American academics and big corporates was actually operating in a really problematic political way uh, to separate out kind of endemic exploitation from this other thing that they decided they were going to have a crusade against. So I spent many years working on this in different ways, working with frontline organizations, working with migrant domestic working women and also as an advisor to the UK's first independent anti-slavery commissioner, which is um, a role appointed by the government, and then subsequently NGOs, um, as I decided to become more and more outspoken. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, framing of modern slavery as in, uh, in the book you talk about a contaminant versus a continuum? So in other words, um, you know, framing it as something that's external to the system, as opposed to something that's built into the economy as it is today. Yes. So I was very familiar with the work of George Lakoff, the cognitive linguist and ideas around framing as being very important for our conceptions of problems and, and what we think the solutions are. And I took that over to this topic. And essentially, what I demonstrate in the book is that we call exploitation, severe forms of it now, modern slavery, right? And that's a choice about words. And of course, words aren't just words. They are also all sorts of connotations, inferences. They bring to mind lots of things. And when we say modern slavery, we're evoking historical slavery. So images of manacles, extreme bad treatment, but also certain other things. So we're conjuring in our mind something that apparently we eradicated in the first half of the 19th century in, in the UK anyway, um, without addressing any of the political or economic structures that were there. So we managed to just pick it up and take it out of our political economy. There we go, nice and done. And the same mindset comes with us into this modern slavery idea where it's like we can just raid and rescue, extricate the bad thing, wipe away the contaminant, done and dusted. Related to that, you very much see that um, historical slavery is raised in speeches, in documents, everything around modern slavery and human trafficking often to do this kind of crusading language and to portray the issue as something that everyone is on the same side against, right? There's no one walking around, yeah. certainly willing to say publicly as a politician that they wish historical slavery had continued, right? We're all against it and we all agree it's immoral. And therefore the same must be true for this thing we're calling modern slavery. So exactly as you said, Julia, it's portraying it as something that's not political. It's not about a political issue. And we actually, uh, I show in some speeches and, and media articles and stuff, you will actually see that written down. Like this is not about politics. 
Of course, it's entirely political because what we're talking about is people seeking livelihoods, people seeking safe migration pathways. You know, in, in the UK, care, care kids who've been in the care sector, brought up in care, going into drug running, or obviously women who don't have access to other other forms of money going to the sex industry and so on. So you can't escape the politics of it, but that's what this idea constructs. And that's why it's both powerful and really frightening. And really insidious, <laughs> right? Because it sort of takes uh, people who have perpetrated the slave trade, you know, the colonizer states especially, and is giving them the power uh, to use this communications weapon as a blunt instrument against the developed world in many, in many and, places. And that is so true, that yeah, especially of- for corporate supply chains as well. So you'll see, it used to be a lot of my job to deal with large companies around this topic, and they'll have, you know, drinks receptions. These are major corporations that you'd be familiar with over there as well. Drinks receptions, shiny brochures about all the things they're doing to tackle modern slavery, when actually the way that they're running their supply chains, the prices that they're willing to pay to the factories in Bangladesh or wherever are so low with such fast turnaround times, they are embedding those very things. Yes, yeah, actually, I found that super interesting, uh, the way you talked about how corporate actors, brands basically get to cast themselves as the heroes of the story, that they're the ones that are investigating, they're the ones that are investigating the suppliers and making sure that there's no malfeasance and no exploitation. Um, But at the same time, they're pressing down on their suppliers, on the manufacturers, uh, giving them these impossible goals to meet with an impossible budget. Uh, So sort of baking that in. So there were um, three things I think that you talked really in depth about, um, three sectors of workers that are uber exploited. One is people in these complex corporate supply chains. And then you also talked about sex workers and migrants. So to start off uh, a little bit more on the on the migrant immigration front, um, I'd love if you could speak a little bit to, you know, you talked really compellingly about uh, this case where um, dozens of, of Vietnamese migrants were found dead in a shipping container. Yeah. And immediately once this happened, the press was calling you up and asking you about human trafficking. And you were sort of confused about this because there's a difference between migration and trafficking. So tell us about, you know, how did the press treat that case and how do they treat it differently than cases where people were found mm. alive? Yeah, so it's a, a really um, kind of perfect and tragic example of how this frame, this narrative, this story about exploitation operates. So yeah, um, uh, in October 2019, 39 Vietnamese people were found dead in in a lorry in um, an area of the UK called Essex, which is kind of fairly near the coast. They would obviously have been driven in. And um, the first thing I knew about it, as you say, was telephone calls coming to me from producers and journalists asking for comment on it. Um, or, you know, the, the news kind of went wild about it because that's a, for us, that's an enormous loss of life. And it was very shocking. Um, and I was completely bemused because, yeah, the, definitionally, all they could have possibly known was the case at that point was that it was migrant smuggling, probably based on ethnicity, based on obviously people don't really hang out in the backs of lorries if they are able to travel safely. So they would probably have crossed the border illegally. That is technically migrant smuggling. Whereas human trafficking in the US as well as the UK, you'd need to have evidence of exploitation. So those people were being exploited. And obviously you can't tell that if you've got people who've passed away in a lorry, you don't know what's been happening or is about to happen to them. And I realized why this was happening, why I was getting these phone calls quite quickly because the politician in the area, the local politician, and also our Home Secretary, um, had immediately started describing it as a case of trafficking. And the press were taking that lead. Now, obviously, for the press, trafficking is a kind of sexy, sensationalist topic, so they will often want to run with that. But um, I could really see that the politicians were pointing in that direction for a very specific reason, which is that when we imagine trafficking as the general public, we have in our mind a kind of um, uh, abduction scenario, kidnapping. And what the problem we think about is the baddie mm-hmm. that's done that. It's this individual villain. Um, you might be familiar with the film Taken, the movie Taken. Um, 
Totally. Yeah. That's exactly, I think, what exactly. everyone was thinking of immediately. So that's yeah. what people have in their mind. In reality, the majority of trafficking in the world is not because of that. Of course, it happens occasionally because there's always exceptions to the rule for everything. But most trafficking happens because it's basically migration gone wrong, like someone can't get the opportunity, get the safety that, that they would have wanted to have, and they fall into the wrong part of the economy. So... Um, when we are being told by politicians you should think about this huge loss of life as trafficking what we're really being told is you should blame the the men basically who did this have that idea of that villain in your mind rather than the alternative which is the border right why do people get into a lorry in order to make a better life and um actually since it sort of all went to court and stuff it wasn't a case of human trafficking at all it was a case of smuggling like i had suspected at the start and indeed the fathers of one of the young people who passed away said he was just trying to get to a better life and earn money for his family back home so it really was that kind of a case and um the way that we can see that what i'm saying is like definitely correct is that a month later in exactly the same part of the uk a lorry was stopped, 10 men were found in the back of that lorry, thankfully they were alive, but they were struggling to breathe, and they were immediately arrested for immigration offences and described in the press as right. suspected migrants, which is this weird phrase that started happening over here in the last three to five years, which, you know, someone's a suspected migrant, like you might be a suspected thief or something. And so you can see that disparity. Well, they're dead, so we're going to say it's trafficking and we're going to feel bad for them. They're alive, so we're going to say it's smuggling and we're going to criminalize them. And it's that clear. In terms of casting, you know, you very clearly show how our villains are being cast in this frame. And now how about our heroes? It sounds like a corporate responsibility, CSR units of, you know, big corporations are sort of writing this playbook. Who are they picking to be the heroes of this? Well, story? they pick themselves, you know, <laughs> um, like really what we see is the kind of the big cheese CEOs who are setting up like award ceremonies and sitting on panels for things or giving some funding to hotlines this kind of thing. Um, and of course, you also do get um, some, uh, it's particularly bad in the US, I'd say, thankfully, we slightly have a less of a problem with it over here, but faith based NGOs that purport to be rescuing people, particularly in the global oh, yeah. south, who get a lot of money. And periodically, there are amazing exposés of what they're actually doing. There's one called That's Exodus true. Cry yeah. that I really recommend Googling and just being appalled at what you find. But they very much are this like, we're ex-law enforcement. We go in, we raid, we rescue without understanding the context, without listening. To the they sound like mercenaries. It's, it's really yeah. frightening, actually. It is really frightening. Let's talk a little bit more about this concept of rescue as well uh, as the concept of victimhood here. So one thing, um, you know, we notice in this narrative, again, there's a clear cut hero, there's a clear cut villain, there's a clear cut victim. And the way, as you were saying, sort of contrasting migrants versus trafficking victims, um, you know, it's similar in the sex work industry where the way victims are framed is that they, they were kidnapped and they've been forced into sex work against their will, whereas in quite a lot of cases, the reality is these are women who maybe wanted to participate in sex work, but then were exploited. And that complexity is totally erased from this narrative. So what does it look like uh, when sex workers or migrants are, quote unquote, rescued in the UK from these situations? You know, we're basically led to believe that it's just sort of this happily ever after ending and then they go on to have a happy life but what actually happens yes. after so rescue? rescue is one of the kind of core components of of the fairy tale of modern slavery right so you've got your baddie you've got your heroes and then you're rescuing people and in reality that's just not what's happening at all of course there are situations which people want to be removed from however in the uk um they're often not removed into a better situation because what you have to understand is that this is a problem of the economy and of immigration policy, basically. And those things don't change. When we take someone out of one situation, okay, so they're no longer with that employer who is behaving in a way that doesn't meet our laws, but they don't have a better option suddenly. Um, so with migrants, specifically with undocumented migrants, um, 
so people who don't have a legal right to be in the UK, uh, that we don't give them the right to be here once they've been confirmed to be victims of trafficking. There is, um, that's not a kind of right we afford to them, even though we know they've been exploited in our country. We provide them with some uh, very low level amount of money a week while their case is looked at. And then once that's dealt with, they're free to, to um, go back into the informal economy where they're hiding from the immigration authorities. They might do an asylum claim, which takes years here, or they might be deported back to where they were originally trafficked from, which is obviously not ideal. We have a lot of victims of trafficking in immigration centers in the UK, so like immigration jails for undocumented people, uh, which has only been exposed relatively recently. And it comes down to this thing of um, essentially that people who are leading this crusade and people who are in positions of power making policy have kind of privileged lives with salaries and they could choose to do different jobs if they wanted to. They're not living in the part of the economy where your best offer is a bad offer. And that's really the problem. That means we can't possibly be rescuing people. With regard to the sex industry, um, and I can say more if you want about kind of trying to understand how trafficking fits into the sex industry because it's a kind of contentious topic. But um, certainly there is a massive, massive problem with trafficking and modern slavery being used, allegedly trying to tackle those things, being used against sex workers. So, for example, raids being done in brothels that purport to be anti-trafficking raids and that are actually just trying to shut the brothels down. So to give you an actual example, I give quite a lot of actual examples of that in the book that um, have been proven. But um, we hosted the Olympics here in 2012. And um, always around big sports events, there's this myth that you get a lot more trafficking for sexual exploitation. And it is a myth. When academics have researched it, it is a myth. But it always happens that that myth happens. And so the mayor of London gave half a million pounds to our London police force to, put, to do extra policing on the sex industry to try to find trafficking in the run up to the Olympics. And a police officer has actually said they use that money just to shut down brothels under the kind of rhetoric of trafficking, right? So you're just taking away marginalized women's livelihood because you feel like it. And that is a, an enormous problem. Often what we see with rescue in the sex industry is someone having their livelihood taken away who is choosing to do it, potentially because they don't have very many options, but it's still the choice that they're making. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you want to elaborate yeah. more speak more to the uh, sex work industry please yeah do. so i think there's a really useful way of thinking about the sex industry in relation to this topic that often somehow gets missed because we end up in this kind of fog of well it's sex work and i don't know some of it's probably bad and like moral stuff and all of this these worries if we think instead that the sex industry operates in the same way as all other work industries, right? By which I mean there's a continuum of conditions that people are working under. So there are the best possible conditions for that industry. We might not like what the industry is maybe, you know, there are a lot of really crap industries, um, but the best possible conditions. We might find that in New Zealand, for example, where um, they've had a sex worker win an employment tribunal against their brothel manager for harassment, for example. So best possible conditions through a kind of downward slope of worse and worse conditions. And that's where you might find um, people who were choosing to be in the sex industry, but now they're being paid way less than they were promised, or they're being told they have to work overtime or provide services they didn't want to. Things that you would also see in other sectors uh, through that continuum. And then at the very far end, the worst possible conditions, which is where you will find real trafficking cases, which we can call rape, because obviously, if people aren't choosing to have that sex, that's called rape, and rape is already illegal. Like, you know, it's already, um, something we don't agree with. And it's the same as in, for example, um, domestic work. If someone was being forced, someone was being kept in a house and forced to work there, we'd call that forced labor. So you've got the same continuum in all sectors. And when you think about the sex industry like that, it really helps to go, okay, so yeah, there are some instances of trafficking. There's a lot more that's um, kind of problematic conditions and very little that's good conditions. So how do we address the real part of the problem, 
while maintaining anti-trafficking laws because we you know we have those and they're there for a reason but they need to work with the industry not against them what would acknowledging this uh, continuum of exploitive practices mean for corporate actors for example so you talk a lot about how uh, again it's this sort of it's seen as Modern slavery is seen as a contaminant. It's totally different from what other things that are going on in the economy. It's something perpetrated by outsiders and villains that don't have anything to do with corporate actors. So if they were to acknowledge this continuum of abusive practices, how would the approach to eliminating exploitation be different? And in particular, I'd love it if you could speak to unions in the way that corporate social responsibility statements and um, pamphlets speak or don't speak about yeah absolutely unions. that's one of my favorite um kind of topics in a way because it's so mind-blowingly stupid <laughs> when you find, realize what it is that they're doing <laughs> um yeah i mean the real answer yeah. if we were taking a, a meaningful approach that actually wanted to address these problems both the very extreme forms of exploitation and the lesser forms is would really be about kind of resilience and rights right rather than raid and rescue get the individual resilience and rights on a systemic level um and that's now thankfully recognized by kind of really respected names in this field so the un special rapporteur on trafficking has basically said that exact same thing we need to address the general abuse in order to address the extreme practically then there are some really obvious things that we should be doing so that includes um labor inspection right so what we call labor market enforcement where are the people who are meant to be checking that minimum wage laws are obeyed i don't know what it's like over there but over here it's hilarious how much they don't really exist how underfunded they are one of our inspectorates that's for agency workers who are very high risk for being abused and exploited has 13 staff a 1.1 million workers, right? That's how many staff they've got to oversee a 1.1 million sector. So it's just completely impossible to actually um, observe, to, to make employers who might want to be a bit dodgy actually obey the laws, right? Related to that, of course, is that everyone needs to have those rights. And so that's where immigration policy creates enormous problems because clearly lots of people don't actually have those rights that they should have. So we need to have labor rights be applicable to anyone regardless of their immigration status, because without that, we just create pockets of our economy where this can thrive. And not only pockets of our economy where it can thrive, but we incentivize structures. So like supply chain structures where there's more outsourcing and things like that. And then that starts to look natural, but it's actually a constructed thing, right? To try to get the cheapest labor possible, which often means abused labor. Related to that, and this does exist in some jurisdictions in the world, we could limit the number of tiers you can have in a supply chain. We could do that, and it does exist in some places. We could limit um, how much outsourcing you can have. So, for example, nowadays, construction companies will often not have any actual construction staff, like employees. They will, it will all be agency work. And there's a reason for that. It's cheaper, and they can essentially get away with dealing with abuse, basically, and have legal distance from it. Uh, unions and other forms of kind of collective worker organization are absolutely key. And I explain in the book, one of the most kind of maddening things about working in this space is being at meetings and roundtables and things like that with large corporations who really want to solve modern slavery, right? They really want to, and they'll sit there um, kind of asking how on earth they can find out how the workers in their supply chains are feeling about their conditions and they'll scratch their heads and someone will mention a new app that might be the solution, right? Totally. And it'll go on like that. And nobody will suggest trade unions, even though obviously unions are the first and foremost way of kind of having a litmus test of what's actually going on on the shop floor, of having a channel for people to communicate concerns and to make sure their rights are upheld. That is what they're for. Um, when I've raised it in those kinds of modern slavery contexts, I'm always told, well, this is outside the bounds of modern slavery because modern slavery is this exceptional contaminant that's like nothing we've seen before and isn't about the general continuum as we've discussed. So it's really interesting that that is kind of um, 
left out of the picture and it needs to be brought back in very i think it's a problem of unions as well they've allowed monsovi to like take the turf away from them basically the other thing i just mentioned um because it is a u.s um massive u.s success story on this is the concept of worker-driven social responsibility there's something called the fair food program Mm. for the tomato industry that is incredible uh, because your agricultural laborers don't have the same rights to unionize as a hangover of slavery in the u.s they've had to take a different approach and it's just really worth looking into because it's got rid of trafficking sexual harassment in the tomato fields it's got people better wages and it's done it through um, grassroots kind of collectivizing and campaigning and then going to the brands that are buying the tomatoes and essentially freaking them out on a reputational level and it's very clever and it's now being transferred to lots of other sectors around the world you know a similar kind of law and order misframing you know it definitely happens with actual just plain old police law enforcement you know we're here doing something they're there doing something else uh and in america one of the most interesting things that the alliance kind of between the police and Hollywood was incredibly interesting and sort of moving that that framing along in which they were feeding Hollywood storylines and give them access to police cars, you know, kind of writing this. Uh, Do you I mean, how do you feel like the culture uh, like, you know, mainstream culture, Hollywood films, you know, television, uh, how are companies sort of diving in to make sure that this frame gets solidified on the tube? Yeah, yeah. So um, the media is basically massively culpable for what's happening. And some of that is corporate funded. Um, So you will see uh, corporate funded advertising or kind of um, like multi week campaigns in major newspapers or on major websites that have corporate funding behind them on this topic. And the language, as I I talk about a bit in the book, the language that you'll see is exactly in this blockbuster thing. The answer is law enforcement. Yeah, and it's all very much in this, um, everything is individualized, right? It's an individual instance of violence rather than a structural problem, or it's because of that bad apple rather than the rotten barrel, as we've said. And I think there are lots of parallels actually with lots of things. So a few years ago, I remember learning that um, there'd been a few attempts at class lawsuits in the US against um, fast food companies for uh, people ending up with obesity and diseases as as a result of eating a lot of their food. And they were called the Personal Responsibility Consumption Acts that people were trying to pass. Um, which mm-hmm. I just found, I, I enjoy um, American legislation names because they always <laughs> yeah. say like the actual thing and we don't really do mm-hmm. it in that way here. Um, but yeah, it really it really surprised <laughs> me at the time because it was so kind of blunt and obvious that it was like, you know, it's a political choice to be like, we're not going to come down on these companies that are choosing to advertise to your kids and putting all these ingredients in things, but we're going to make you responsible for it. And I think it's very, very comparable to that in a way. And it's kind of, in general, it's the neoliberal approach, isn't it? Really? Yeah, to draw another major parallel to the US, I think one thing that was super frustrating for us on the left over the last um, four or five years was this conception of President Mm -hmm. Trump as this aberration rather than a continuation of the Republican Party policies. So that was that was something that we saw across every single uh, political topic, you know, Trump was cast continually as something that was separate from, different from, and um, totally uh, not related to what came before him. And I actually want to relate this back to uh, abuse in the supply chain because there was a big expose in the Washington Post about Ivanka Trump's uh, manufacturing, garment manufacturing companies. So there's this whole expose and it was like, uh, Ivanka Trump, Ivanka Trump, Ivanka Trump, Ivanka Trump is abusing workers. Like she personally is abusing workers because if you go into this supply chain, uh, you're going to find all of these manufacturers, garment manufacturers that are abusing people. At the same time, the Washington Post has been a big uh, water carrier for international trade deals with a complete lack of oversight in factories like these. So rather than framing it as Uh, we have a lack of oversight into how our garments are made generally, or even drawing that connection between Ivanka Trump and other corporate actors. They cast Ivanka Trump as the sole villain outside of a structure that promotes this behavior. And they even went so far as in the article to say, 
you know, just very generically, like at a time when other manufacturers have moved away from these practices, which isn't true at all. Um, so really, um, the exact same dynamic you're talking about, which is picking a specific villain to avoid dealing with the structural issue. Um, and I did I did also mm -hmm. want to ask about, um, you know, personal responsibility, that side of it that you were speaking about. I thought it was really funny that um, you talked about how they did a study. Someone did a study. You can speak to the details about what people know about modern slavery. And the whole report basically said, you know, like the public is so misinformed and they're so wrong. And actually everything the public intuitively knew was actually pretty correct. Like they were like. Uh, I don't think it's something I can I can choose to change through my shopping habits because it's it's really these corporate actors that are committing these these crimes. And also, like, I don't want to report someone because I'm afraid they're going to get deported. Oh. Like, I, it doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, and the whole report basically the whole report basically said, like, oh, we need to reeducate these people. So <laughs> can you speak a little bit more to that um, study and their findings and their analysis yes. versus yeah. um, you know, your feelings about it? So we've had this massive push here and i know that it's common in lots of countries around the world actually that consumers are the answer to modern slavery to solving modern slavery if we just shop right then everything will be okay and you know we can feel like good capitalist citizens and it's definitely kind of one of the main themes we have and there's all sorts of apps developed to help us do that or to report if we think we've seen someone on our high street who might be a victim and so um, there were a group of academics who did some research to try to understand, well, what do consumers actually know about this modern slavery thing? Um, do they know what it means? How do they how do they interrelate with the topic and what therefore does that mean we need to do to get consumers to be better able to engage with it? So you're already starting from a premise that assumes that consumers are a huge part of the answer, which um, I don't think they are. But uh, what it was, it was very interesting reading their results because, as you say, they generally the public that were part of this research weren't sure where the threshold was between kind of labour abuse, so like you're not being paid the minimum wage or whatever, and and modern slavery. Like what exact what actually is so bad that you can call it modern slavery? And the conclusion was that there needs to be more education. Well, in reality, if you understand the range of legal terms that are housed by this phrase, modern slavery, you would know that um, there isn't a clear threshold and that you can have circumstances that don't actually seem that extreme that can fit into trafficking. So, you know, if someone's been recruited and they've been told they're going to be paid £100 a day and then they're being paid £40 a day, that would actually potentially fit a trafficking definition because they're being recruited under fraudulent claims and then they're being exploited because it's less than the minimum wage. Everything else could be fine for them and it, they could be happy with the, the, their situation, which is actually something we see when police try to police trafficking here, is that some people are like, could you go away please? Because this is my best job option available. So the, the public were right. like. Uh, Judges aren't sure of the threshold. Lawyers aren't sure of the threshold. Obviously, you get cases that are really obvious, but that's, you know, that's the exception. They also were very clear that they didn't feel that they were personally responsible for it and that they felt this was really an issue for companies or the state to do something about. Um, now, of course, it would be nice to live in a world where everyone has the income and the time to do research to shop ethically, though whether or not that's actually feasible with the supply chains of all of the things, you know, it's not unless you you know someone down the road with a sheep and you're getting your your jumper knitted by that wool, you're not going to be able to do it anyway. Um, so you know they were right. It's not it's not really their responsibility, and it is this structural thing. If we changed our immigration policy so we stopped making people criminals because they don't have the right paperwork, we would radically reduce the amount of exploitation in the UK. That's got nothing to do with where we're shopping. Um, they also, um, something that was again kind of funny in this research, that in the UK, comparable to the California law, where um, which requires companies to make these disclosures about what they're doing to tackle trafficking in their supply chains, we have the same thing. We require large companies to make an annual disclosure saying what steps, if any, and that's an important two words, what steps, if any, they're taking to tackle uh, trafficking in their supply chains. And so 
the, this um, this bit of the law was very much touted by our prime minister at the time as being really crucial to the su success of the UK and in vanquishing modern slavery because it meant consumers could understand whether the places they were shopping at were doing good things or not because they could go and read these statements right now obviously nobody does that because that's not how anybody shops and as I say in the book what are you going to look up if you're in a supermarket you're going to look up the supermarket or the brand of toothpaste you're in front of or the manufacturer of that toothpaste etc 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 so it's not really feasible nonetheless these um the public that were researched in this in this report said they don't really want to read long reports they're not really going to do that which obviously we could have all predicted um so the the conclusion drawn was that we need to have shorter reports from companies which <laughs> just shows the utter kind of nonsensical situation we're in because to what extent is someone random who doesn't work on this going to know if they read like apple's you know, little half paragraph about what they're doing to tackle trafficking and exploitation in their supply chain. How are they going to know if they're actually doing it, if what they're saying is meaningful, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole thing becomes this smoke and mirrors, this attempt to make the consumer responsible when it's, it's just completely infeasible. And it's definitely a deflection from the, the government having to do something. Right. So basically anything except empowering workers and making it safe for them to um, talk to mm -hmm. authorities or talk to whoever about the fact that they're being exploited. So we have these large groups, migrants, sex workers, people in corporate supply chains, um, who all are being exploited in the informal economy uh, and have no pathway to, no pathway out of exploitation. Um, and then we have corporate actors who as you said, are really um, putting on a show for the government to avoid the government stepping in and regulating them. Um, I'd be interested, uh, before we go, just to drill down on a couple more things. Uh, you talked about corporate resp social responsibility and the, these business audits. So this is like another, another prong of um, another tool that corporate actors use it's also to, sort a way of to like stave pay off government to do these regulations. So, you know. what are these audits? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, audits how do they operate, are, and why are they ineffective? Um, checks on on supply chains, basically. So, someone will go along periodically uh, with you know a clipboard and a checklist, and they will work out what's going on. They might want to. They might ask to look at some paperwork. If they're doing their job better than some, then they might interview workers off the site. So often they won't, they'll only talk to the workers that the management suggests they talk to, um, and they may not talk to workers at all, right? So, um, so audits are basically a, a mechanism by which a company hires another company to go in and check and confirm that everything is fine, right? In their supply chain. And, and I phrase it in that way deliberately. Um, and in addition, this idea of modern slavery being so extreme, what you'll find is auditors are often only looking for very extreme things to, for them to report as potential cases. So they will report potential cases, but only if they present in this like insanely extreme way, which isn't actually what the definitions are. The thing about audits that's important, really, because they obviously sound very boring, but the thing that makes them interesting is that they are um, a, a signifier of power dynamics, right? It is the company operating upon the worker. So the assumption there is that the workforce have nothing to say for themselves. The workforce shouldn't be the ones who are saying, hey, this isn't OK. Hey, that's not OK. Instead, it should be a corporate person that's paid, comes in, observes and leaves on one day rather than the workers being listened to and being allowed to organize in a way that makes them be the frontline defenders of their rights every single day so that would be things like unions and that's the power problem that we have at play and that's the entire way that the corporate anti-slavery mm. model works it's to pretend the workforce are essentially like amorphous liquid that we just need to occasionally pick out a problem from but we shouldn't be kind of listening to in any way right and this goes back to that same sort of like 
victim rescue narrative, um, you know, similarly with migrants and sex workers, rather than having migrants speaking about their experience or sex workers speaking about, you know, what would actually be helpful for yeah. sex workers. We have these charities and, or, you know, NGOs, organizations that are not run by sex workers that are sort of voluntarily saying, okay, well, here's what we think is good for sex workers. Um, so I guess if you could just uh, leave us with something, maybe speak a little bit to, in terms of reform in all of these areas, you know, what what do advocates and what do people want to see um, to make all of these environments safer for workers? Yeah, so I think um, the very obvious thing uh, mm-hmm. and unfortunately true in so many countries around the world is to end the criminalization of people because of their immigration status so that everybody has the same rights and to make sure that people can try to travel to safety across the world without becoming illegal. You know, refugees cannot get to places without being deemed illegal and that makes no sense as a as a process. So without doubt, that's absolutely essential. Nobody can pretend to actually care about modern slavery issues unless that's one of their, their demands. With the sex industry, we absolutely have to decriminalize the sex industry because the best way to create a thriving pool of trafficking is to take away people's rights. And obviously people in the sex industry don't have rights when they're criminalized and doubly so if they're also migrants without without the right paperwork. So we have to decriminalize the sex industry and at the same time have an anti-trafficking strategy within it, just like we need to have in farming construction and everything else, right? And then with corporations, it's exactly as we've discussed, it's about stopping this being a conversation about consumers and making it into a conversation about business models, about structures and being really deliberate about that and refusing to play this game where we can shop our way out of exploitation because we can't. Emily, thank you so much. And Julia, thank you so much for putting this together. I think you lay out the argument just so clearly. It's just really helpful to hear it in such a coherent, cogent way. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Thank Emily. You. And uh, to all our, our viewers, definitely check out um, Emily's book, The Truth About Modern Slavery. <laughs>